everyone. All right, talk to the middle of the microphone. Do you remember how to do this? I'm not sure. We'll see. I have a new clicker, so anything's possible. Okay, so tonight, at the end of this evening where we had a lot more art than, than usual, which, wow, everyone, that was awesome. Thank you, guys. I want to take it back to one of uh, the most famous mutinies that any of us have heard of. It may be, in fact, the most famous mutiny of all, but first... I have a little diversion. I'd like to introduce you to a badass. This young man here is Louis Martin, possibly Louis Martin, I'm not totally sure. He made his own name, so he could be kind of either way. He was born in 1913 in Massachusetts, and he went on to lead a life of extraordinary adventure. He was a globe-trotting explorer. He was a writer, a filmmaker, a diver, a navigator, and a linguist. As a teenager, for fun, he taught himself five languages, including ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. He also became a pioneer in color photography. In 1932, at the age of 19, he wrote a book called Color Photography with a Miniature Camera, which led to him being hired by National Geographic, for which he produced some very colorful images. This is apparently the main lobster girls in the 1950s. I really, really dig those outfits. Um, <laughs> Among other adventures over his life, he sailed with Jacques Cousteau on the Calypso. In Madagascar, he discovered an intact egg specimen of the extinct elephant bird, once the world's largest bird, that still had the embryonic skeleton of the unborn chick inside. There is a rare orchid that he discovered, named after him, and it's quite pretty. He worked for NASA, he flew ultralight planes, and he lived here in this amazing house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Later in life, after he retired, he and his mathematician wife sailed the course that Christopher Columbus took and suggested a different landing place than the traditional narrative holds. And in 1957, he was the one that found the wreck of the HMS Bounty. This is how I first came to know this story. I grew up with shelves full of National Geographics in my house, inherited from my grandparents. And in the December 1957 issue, Martin recounted his expedition to the remote island of Pitcairn in search of the HMS Bounty, burned in the bay by mountain, by not mountaineers, mutineers <laughs> in 1790, very different. Um, the waters were dangerous and reportedly the locals told him it was even crazy to try. But eventually, they found the site in relatively shallow waters. And I've reread that article so many times over the years, and it really is. I encourage you all to find a copy of it. It's online. It really is an example of the excellence of this magazine in its heyday, and such a, a powerful example of first-person narrative. I continue to be inspired by it. And it was from this story that I first learned the story of the famous mutiny. By a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the basic outline of the, the mutiny on the bounty? A little more than, little more than half? A little lot of people. It may be the single most famous naval, naval mutiny in history, and it has everything. It has an ill-fated, kind of stupid mission, an evil tyrant of a captain. It has sexy native girls and bold and dashing young sailors. And it all makes for a perfect setting for a righteous uprising and the start of a utopian escape to a world, uh, escape from the world to a remote yet weirdly luxurious tropical island. <laughs> it should probably surprise no one here that most of this is wrong. The bounty was real, the mutiny happened, but the story has been warped through retellings to the point where it's almost unrecognizable. So a few, a few quick facts about the actual, the actual trip and the mutiny. The Bounty was a tiny ship. It was a retrofitted cutter built in 1784. She was 90 feet long and she had three masts and she was among the smallest of the warships, the smallest category of warships in the British Navy. And she carried no Marines. This is an important fact that will come up later. Her mission was the pursuit of breadfruit on the island of Tahiti, thought to be an ideal potential crop stable for the British slaves held in the, in the West Indies. And it's interesting to note that this, this adventure happens long after slavery was illegal in the British Isles, but they still kept slavery until 1833 in the, in the uh, West Indies. Yeah. Um, this mercantile expedition was not the idea of the Navy, even though it was their ship. This idea was from Joseph Banks, the famous naturalist who had sailed on James Cook's first expedition and who is now the president of the Royal Society back in London. The Navy, fresh out of wars at the moment, decided to offer up a small ship and some otherwise unoccupied sailors for the expedition. Ships, well, ship in this case, one small cutter that they weren't using at the moment. 
The man in command of this mission was William Bly, a name that has gone down in history. He was an experienced captain of previous, of previous commands, and he had sailed on James Cook's less uh, happy ending third rather more disastrous expedition. Uh, but he was not captain of the bounty. The bounty didn't have a captain. The commander of a cutter has the rank of lieutenant. So in order to take this command, it was actually both a pay cut and a reduction of rank for him to take this. But he took it because it was an opportunity to make his name in the world. The bounty was... <laughs> The bounty was crewed by 46 men, 44 naval men, and two civilian botanists charged to take care of the breadfruit that they were going to bring back. Most of the men were under 30. Bly was just 33 years old. They set sail from England in, in 18, sorry, 1787, intending to sail west and under, the Cape, and under Cape Hope to Tahiti. But when they got there, after five months at sea, they encountered such harsh weather that they actually had to turn back and retrace their steps and sail east and go under the Cape of Good Hope. <laughs> Understandably, no one was happy about this situation. Um, so they stopped and did a supply and repair stop in South Africa and another one in Australia, and they finally arrived in Tahiti in October of 1788, just about a year after they had left England. And it was everything that they had hoped for. The land was lush, the natives were accommodating and exceptionally friendly, the sheltered waters were calm, the coconuts were delicious. The men settled, it, settled in, the botanists went to work preparing the breadfruit trees for transport, and they ended up staying in Tahiti for five months. As much as all of the men of the bounty enjoyed the reprieve of duties and the lushness of the land, what really sold them on it was the ladies. The young women of Tahiti and the Tahitian society in general was extremely libertine and free by any European standard. Sex was frequent and casual with no obligations or attachments required. Most of the men spent as much time as possible drunk and in the company of lovely young ladies. It was a lifestyle to be envied. By February, the breadfruit plants were almost ready and they began loading a thousand plants onto the bounty. On the 1st of April, Sad, sad sailors, packed back up and set sail for home. The men, having grown accustomed to their new lifestyles and lovers, were loath to leave, and the very first desertion plan was actually before they actually managed to set sail and was thwarted just before departure. On the route home, relationships started to go south. Bly and his men began to spiral downhill. In particular, the relationship between Fletcher, Fletcher Christian and Bly, despite being very friendly on the original expedition, turned notably sour. Small altercations led to recriminations. Recriminations led to plotting. And then, in the wake of some petty theft on board, at his wit's end, exasperated, Bly cut off the rum supply. It's on April 27th. The mutiny came the next morning on April 28th. <laughs> Less than a month since they had left Tahiti. It was led by Fletcher Christian and apparently unopposed. Bly was taken in his nightshirt and brought trust onto deck. The mutineers lowered the ship's launch um, a small rowboat with a, with a mast, and ordered Bly and any men loyal to him on board. Now, it's worth pointing out that there were so many men that were loyal to Bly that they couldn't all actually fit onto the launch, and the mutineers required a few very skilled men to stay behind because otherwise they couldn't sail the ship without them. So Bly and 18 of the loyal men were crammed onto this 23-foot longboat. And now, as uh, James pointed out earlier, this space above me is about 20 feet long, so that's just three feet longer than that space. 19 men. They were provisioned generously by the mutineers with about one week's worth of rations. Four cutlasses, a tool chest, one sextant, one compass, and no maps or, or charts of any kind. They were cut loose and set adrift, 19 men on a tiny boat, settled low in the water about seven inches above the sea approximately 30 miles from the closest land. The bounty turned around and set sail back to the friendly shores of Tahiti. The first thing the men on the launch did was head for that closest island called Tafua. They successfully landed and began stashing food supplies, but within a week they found themselves on the receiving end of a hostile ambush. Grabbing everything they could, they made a break for the launch, and then in the effort to untie the tiny boat from the shore, one man was seized and stoned to death. His body was dragged off right in front of all of the men on the launch, and the Tofuans clacked stones together. 
in a threatening sound warning anyone else that dared come back ashore. Horrified, everyone on the launch rode and rode and watched the violent death of their comrade and could do nothing. Bly vowed at that moment not to go ashore again even if they passed other islands until he reached the European-held territories in the East Indies. Calculating the possible distance in his head and relying on the memory of maps he drew on the Cook expedition, he uh, did the math and immediately imposed brutal rations, a mouthful of food a day augmented primarily with rainwater. So before I go any further, I want to return to that tiny vessel. And I'd like to take a moment and close your eyes and imagine yourself stuffed onto a glorified rowboat, shoulder to shoulder, closer than you're sitting now, with 17 terrified companions. You've just seen one man die. You realize the de desperate situation you face, tropical heat, tropical storms. It is unbelievably cramped and hot you are facing starvation almost immediately. Everyone is in a shitty, terrible mood all the time, and there is nowhere to go. And beyond you, the vastness of the sea. As they made their miserable way across the southern seas, Bly kept a cramped journal of the voyage and drew new maps. Uh, most importantly, a list of the names and the description of each of the mutineers. Because he wasn't just taking this terrible little boat to safety, he wasn't just rescuing his men, he was getting revenge on the assholes who had taken his ship. Over the next six weeks, using celestial navigation, dead reckoning, and memory, William Bly led his increasingly agitated and unhealthy men over an estimated 3,800 nautical miles of open sea. By contrast, Ernest Shackleton's extraordinary story of survival that is often cited off, off of Antarctica was 720 nautical miles. 3,800 nautical miles is the equivalent of about 4,400 land miles. So to give you perspective, that is essentially the distance from where we are now in San Francisco to Lima, Peru. No stops, mouthful of food. Finally, on June 14th, it's a week from now, Bly raised an improvised Union Jack made of shreds of clothing and sailed into the Dutch settlement of Kupang Harbor in Indonesia. Starving on the edge of insanity and death, all 18 men who had left Tafua survived to see Kupang. And then four promptly dropped dead. <laughs> Turns out starvation and, and all those things are really, really, really bad for you. Um, in the aftermath, Bly returned to England where he was exonerated of any wrongdoing and hailed as a hero and a survivor. The British Navy dispatched a ship, the HMS Pandora, to search for mutineers in Tahiti. Bly was the hero of his own story. He had successfully made his reputation as an officer and as a gentleman and a badass on the bounty voyage, or so he thought. But meanwhile, back on the bounty, things had gone downhill swiftly. As it turns out, at least in this case, a bunch of men motivated primarily by the dream of a dissolute, a dissolute life of drunkenness and vice turn out to be crappy long-term companions. So there's a whole other somewhat Schadenfreude-filled story here, but quickly, in a nutshell, the bounty and its 25 men set sail in the end not for Tahiti, but for the island of Tibuai, reasoning that it was like far enough away from Tahiti to avoid search parties, but still able to go there if they needed ladies. Um, and it was certain to be just as accommodating. But as it turns out, not so much. They got a very hostile reception almost immediately. Eventually, they went back to Tahiti, in theory, to resupply, resupply, uh, where the natives were kind of actually really tired of them. They had had their fun, and they had seen the last of them, and they weren't ready to have them back anytime soon. And it was pretty quickly made clear that they weren't welcome back in any kind of a long-term way. Sixteen of the men decided that they wanted to stay ashore, regardless. And so they were left ashore uh, after the remainder of the men promised that they would take the bounty away. That night, the men still on the ship held a rollicking party on the ship and invited all the pretty girls. And then abruptly set sail, taking captives of 20 Tahitians. They eventually dropped six of them off on another island because the mutineers decided that they had no use for elderly ladies. The bounty finally found its home on the remote island of Pitcairn, and the reason they chose it is that it had been conveniently mislocated on the maps of the era. It was about 180 miles off from where it appeared on the charts, so they thought they might be safe. But to ensure 
that they stayed there and that they were really committed to this gig. And this was the final destination. Fletcher Christian and the rest of the mutineers set fire to the bounty in the shallow waters of the bay. And with that, they disappeared. The location of the ship and the men became a mystery to the outside world. So at this point, with a certain fate, level of fate uncertain, I'd like to say that when deciding who is the hero and who is the bad guy, it's important to remember who wrote the story and what they had to prove. In Bly's mind, and in the immediate aftermath of the court martials, he was a hero, the star of an incredible, unlikely voyage, a survivor and a savior of his men. It was not until years later that his reputation began to slide, and partially that was legitimately on him. Although he was a relatively reasonable and non-tyrannical captain by the, by the standards of the day, uh, by most personal accounts and any reasonable comparison with other captains, Later on in his career, he became known for being stern and disciplinarian and was unlikable, and in the end, his career was marred not by one, but two further mutinies. <laughs> but at least some, if not most of the blame, has come from depictions of Bly in fiction and film, where he's been turned from an unpopular and kind of grumpy captain who didn't want to indulge in the, the licentiousness of his men into a ruthless tyrant for the sake of plot lines. The mutineers, in turn, got something of a polish. Their desires to break free from the domineering life of the Navy in favor of a free love, tropical utopia seem somewhat reasonable if not to be envied. But in reality, the mutineers pretty much to a one turned out to be the real villains in this story. Not only were they basically drunken louts in general, not only were they Navy men who rose up against their commanding officers on relatively trivial matters, not only did they set those commanding officers adrift with meager rations expecting them to meet their death, not only that, but they kidnapped young men and women to effectively be their slaves, sexual and otherwise, in their new tropical paradise. And in the end, that tropical paradise swiftly became a hellscape of vitriol, suicide, and mass murder. Fletcher Christian, in fact, was among the first to die at the hands of his Tahitian captives. By the time the settlement at Pitcairn was finally discovered in 1808, only one mutineer had survived, basically by being the most ruthless asshole amongst ruthless assholes. I feel the need to point out that his name was John Adams. <laughs> this is a two for tonight. Also, the town on Pitcairn is named for him. It's Adamstown, so way to go down in history. Um, and the other mutineers, the ones that went back to Tahiti and stayed there, Two of them had already been murdered by the time the HMS Pandora caught up with them and arrested the survivors to bring them to stand trial. And shortly thereafter, the Pandora sunk, taking with them 31 of the crew and four of the 14 prisoners still chained below the decks. Of the men that returned to England, most of them were found guilty of the crime of mutiny. A few of them were loyal to Bly and were pardoned, and they faced death by hanging. So I'd like you to consider this. Bly was a jerk. Absolutely, but his memory has also been unfairly maligned. The mutineers have mostly gone down in history as if not the good guys, and at least the ones that you would prefer to have a drink with. But as it turns out, they were actually very much in pretty much all the ways the bad guys in this story. And paradise is often not what it's cracked up to be. And I think there's something important here that we've seen over and over and over again that the history books don't really explicitly state, but that seems obvious in context, and that's that jerks in history have something very inherently in common. It takes a certain kind of person to live a life of bold adventure, to leave your partner and beloved children, as Bly did, at home for a multi-year mission with uncertain promise of, of return, and it takes a certain kind of person to decide that that first person is unreasonable and to rise up in mutiny, steal a ship, and set men adrift. Mostly not nice people. So maybe you don't have to be a jerk to go down in history, but I'm going to suggest that it doesn't hurt. And I also think this, there is a relative scale of jerks, and a jerk can still be a hero who saved the lives of 17 men who mostly didn't even like him that much. But I also think that what this story has taught me is that there's also room in history for different kinds of explorers and tellers of stories who live extraordinary lives of adventure and curiosity, inspiring others through action and words, and who may have actually worn cufflinks made of nails from the bounty. So I would like to raise my glass to remembering that history is complicated and that it's important to not whitewash the stories and recognize the jerks that came before us. <laughs>